Okay, welcome everybody to um, our pa pediatric post-operative pain assessment management webinar. Um, so this webinar is going to be recorded um, so that we can use for future use. I'll also share our link at the end um, so that you know where to access it for your staff. Um, so just a reminder, my name is Alicia. I'm an interprofessional education specialist working with uh, community partners for pediatric surgical engagement. Um, today, our webinar today will be hosted um, by the Acute Pain Service um, at SickKids. Um, so very thankful that we have a few speakers today. So we have uh, Jacqueline Hanley and Ashley Harvey. So uh, Jacqueline and Ashley started their career as RNs on the multi-organ transplant medical specialties unit at SickKids. Uh, Jacqueline has worked as a clinical nurse specialist with the Acute Pain Service since 2015 and Ashley since 2020. In their roles, they provide consult, consult and collaborative pain management for pediatric patients with post-surgical and complex pain needs. Uh, Jacqueline completed a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Psychology from McMaster University and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Toronto. Ashley holds a Bachelor of Medical Science from the University of Western Ontario and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from York University. Both also have a Master of Nursing from U of T and hold an adjunct lecture appointment within the Faculty of Nursing there. Uh, Jacqueline and Ashley are passionate about improving pain management for pediatric patients and aspire to promote best pain practices along with safe opioid use. Uh, they are engaged in research, quality improvement, and education related to opioid, opioid stewardship and regularly develop and deliver pain assessment and management education for nurses, interdisciplinary healthcare professionals, and health discipline students as part of their role. So thank you both of you for being here and I will pass it off to you to get started. Thanks, Alicia. Um, it's uh, nice to see some people logged in today. Um, and uh, Ashley and I were joking before the seminar that um, by combining our bios, it makes it sound like we're basically the same person because we've followed a very similar career trajectory. Um, and so we thought it was important to highlight that we are not, in fact, the same person. Um, so, for example, I like to mountain bike and Ashley does not. Um, and she likes metal music and I tolerate it. So those are the key differences that we thought were important for everyone to know about us here today. Um, so we're, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to share uh, some information with you all about pediatric post-op pain assessment and management. Uh, we have about an hour, just under an hour today, and uh, we'll sort of do a high level overview. Um, feel free to jump in with questions if you need to. Um, just a few webinar guidelines that Connected Care has laid out for all of us today. Um, you can unmute any time to ask questions. Uh, if you feel like having your video on, if you feel comfortable, safe doing that, uh, go for it. We also understand if you're not able to um, have your video on today, um, please use the chat um, and participate as much as, as you'd like. Um, and uh, yeah, we're happy to have you here. Let's dive in. Uh, I am going to start off um, this, uh, this lecture in the way that I often uh, do for um, people who are not internal to our organization. Um, and I think it's just really important um, for our listeners today to know that the, the lens that Ashley and I present from and the vantage point from which this information comes from um, is that we are both pediatric nurses, inpatient nurses who have always worked in pediatrics, always worked inpatient and always worked here at Sick Kids, um, which is a high resource in acute care setting. And so the experiential knowledge that we uh, contribute and the little, you know, clinical pearls of wisdom, they come from that lens. We work on a consulting team. We are no longer um, bedside nurses, although we both were in the past. Um, but all of this information is going to impact, uh, or all of this background about us is going to impact the information that we share. Um, and we recognize that some of the experiences that we have here, the patient populations and the even the resources that we may have um, are not necessarily consistent across other environments. Uh, so we just want to acknowledge that um, before we move on. 
Uh, I'm going to start off by uh, doing a very high level uh, overview of some of the factors that modify the pediatric pain experience. So I understand that, you know, one of the purposes of this talk today is to really highlight differences in um, pediatric nursing care when it comes to pain assessment and management. Um, and so I just really um, want to address some of the sort of child specific, although this could certainly apply to adult populations as well, but different things that will modify the pain experience. We, we know that the perception of pain and subsequently how we react to and express pain reflects our physical and psychological development. And unlike adults who, for the most part, we can kind of assume are at civil, similar levels of physical and psychological um, logical development, with some exceptions, of course, um, the pediatric population really has a great variability in development. And we know that the pain experience does not follow a direct pathway from the stimulus that causes pain to then the subsequent perception and expression of pain or the behaviors that come along with pain. And then, so this slide is basically demonstrating that there are a number of cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and then child specific factors that will impact the pain experience. I'll draw attention to a few that are on here. Um, so I include gender and sex because there's evidence that males and females have different responses to pain and perceive it differently. Some of that's re uh, related to the social aspect of gender, maybe the way that um, a girl may be raised versus the way a boy is or certain qualities that may be associated with, you know, gender norms. Uh, but some of it also relates to genetic, hormonal, physiological differences attributed to each sex. Um, another interesting one on this uh, slide here is perceived control. And I think that's really important in the pediatric population. So a child who feels that they understand, say, a needle poke procedure or the surgery they've gone through, um, when they understand what it means to them and why it's happening, when they might have feel they have a sense of control over when and how it happens, they are going to be less likely to experience um, pain in a way that feels, um, you know, very uh, um, acute and distressing to them versus somebody who um, doesn't have any perceived control over their situation or doesn't understand it. Um, oh, moving over to the behavioral category. Category, the orange section there. Um, I've included the role that family distress and caregiver responses um, play in influencing a child. So one takeaway here is that each child and family you see will have a unique experience of pain. And knowing this is important because it shapes your assessment approach, which in turn is in forming your management approach, right? Like we can't have good management without having a good background of assessment. Um, and I think all these things also impact how we speak to our patients about their pain and how we provide education about pain. And each of these factors that modify the pain experience, they provide an opportunity for an intervention to help address pain and discomfort. So anytime you ask, identify there is something that is impacting that pathway from stimulus to perception and response that presents an opportunity for intervention. So we can work with families and children to increase their sense of perceived control. We can educate patients and families about pain and pain treatments to relieve distress. We shape our interventions to their developmental level, their emotional state and their cognitive abilities. So just think it's important to, to recognize that. So now that Jacqueline's covered some of the factors that can modify a child's pain experience, the next few slides, uh, we're gonna sort of break down the various pieces that make up a thorough pain assessment. So we often see in practice um, clinicians who will ask patients to rate the severity or the intensity of their pain. And that's often where the assessment stops, but there's so much more information that help us understand what a patient is feeling in order to develop an effective uh, pain management plan. So the table that we have pictured here um, is actually from the RNAO Assessment and Management of Pain Best Practice Guideline that was published in 2013. And it uses an acronym that that we like to share with new nurses when they start at SickKids and we're doing some education with them. Um, so the acronym is OPQRSTUV, and it does help to guide some of the questions that can help um, to really allow us to do a thorough pain assessment. And obviously this is going to be uh, a little bit more useful for patients who um, are able to communicate with us or um, alternatively, if we're dealing with some of our younger patients who may not be able to communicate as clearly with us.
us, we can sometimes rely on caregivers to also uh, sort of fill in some of the blanks. Um, I know uh, Alicia had informed us that some of uh, the folks on the webinar today were um, in the PACU environment. So I appreciate that not all of these questions may be reasonable to ask in a, in a recovery setting and, and may all actually also not even be that helpful, but it's still nice to kind of see all of the questions laid out. Um, but I thought it might be useful to actually draw your attention to some of the few key questions that we think might be a little bit more helpful in a PACU environment. So once your patient is awake enough, you can ask them what the pain actually feels like or what the quality of the pain is. So for example, is it more of a sharp or stabbing pain versus a squeezing or a tightness or a pressure? Because um, this can obviously help to differentiate um, what, what sort of pain we're dealing with. If it's more sort of incisional, very specific to the surgical site, is it more a muscle spasm or some other type of spasm that we might be dealing with that would help us target the type of pharmacological intervention we may want to give? Um, asking if the pain is more constant in nature or if it's coming and going can also help differentiate between different types of pain. Um, obviously, I had mentioned already about asking about the severity or intensity, um, using a self-report scale if possible and appropriate, um, and also ensuring that um, we're doing reassessment and that that's occurring in a timely fashion after an intervention uh, so that we can actually determine whether or not the intervention we've given is um, effective or not. And then right down at the bottom under V for values, it's often helpful to ask a patient what their pain goal is or what the patient's manageable level of pain is, because that gives us a target to work towards. Often it's also an opportunity for us to provide education and discuss pain expectations after surgery, um, which we're gonna discuss a little bit more on an upcoming slide. So really the, the key, key takeaway from this slide is just to say that you know, with a few additional questions, we're able to get a lot more information on the type of pain um, that a, a patient is experiencing or what their pain experience is like, and it can really help us to um, target our pain management strategy. So in terms of um, different other pieces that make up our pain assessment, in the next section here, we're gonna talk about our physiological assessment. So looking at our head to toe assessment and vital signs. Um, so often, not often, but sometimes these physiological assessments pieces of our assessments can in fact tell us a little bit more about how severe a patient's pain may be. But we also think it's important to stress that physiological indicators um, usually shouldn't be solely relied upon to tell us that a patient is in pain because we also know that these, uh, these pieces of information can sometimes be nonspecific. So we know that pain activates the autonomic nervous system and the physiological changes we can see include things like tachycardia and diaphoresis, just to name a few. But we also know that when we see these changes in patients who are um, febrile, uh, anemic, hypovolemic, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're in pain. It may mean that there are other um, uh, conditions that are occurring. So uh, again, sort of thinking about key takeaway from this particular slide, it's just to remember that physiological findings should definitely be taken into consideration as a part of your pain assessment, but should complement the assessment and not necessarily be used as a sole indicator for pain. Um, so when we talk about pain severity or pain assessment, we often think of the numerical rating scale in adults, at least when I think back to my days when I did do um, my nursing school placements in adult setting, and we were often using the numerical rating scale. But we have a number of other validated pain assessment tools that we use in pediatrics that we'd like to share with you today. So we also would like to highlight that self-report is considered the gold standard of pain assessment because we're getting firsthand information directly from our patients. So whenever possible, we should always include uh, a self-report, if again, if appropriate. Um, we can also combine self-report scales and the information we get with that, um, with behavioral assessments, as well as our physiological assessments, which we just chatted about. And all of those can be used to help supplement our pain assessment. So for older children, often about seven years or so, um, although obviously this varies depending on um, uh, the child's development, we, we do often use the numerical rating scale, which um, most people are probably aware of, but we do um, use the scale as a, an 11 point scale. So where zero is no pain at all, and 10 out of 10 is the worst possible pain you can imagine. Um, for younger kids, we may use a verbal descriptor scale where pain is rated as uh, small, medium, or big. 
And this scale is often used for kids around three to five years of age, but some older children who may not want to use numbers or may not, the numbers might not drive with them very well, um, using words or a verbal descriptor scale can still be helpful. Um, at the bottom here, um, we have the faces pain scale. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in one second. Um, and some children do prefer to use that. So basically this is a picture that I've just popped up here of what the faces pain scale looks like. And you can actually show it to the child and ask them to point to the face that shows how much hurt or how much pain they have. And depending on the child, they may have a different word for pain. So like I use the word hurt, sometimes it could be owie. So like you can work with the caregiver to figure out what is the best word to use. And each face corresponds with a number out of 10. Um, the scale, obviously, it does require you to have the image available and printed at the bedside. Uh, it's not as widely used as some of the other scales that we use, um, and it does cover a lot of the same ages that we've discussed with the NRS and the verbal descriptor scale. So I think, um, you know, it's it's very easy to get by with just using the numerical rating scale and verbal descriptor scale and just know that there is a faces pain scale available in a situation if you feel like it's appropriate to pull out but we probably recommend just sticking with the nrs and the verbal descriptor scale um, just in terms of development it's helpful to know that usually by toddler age most children can have um, some words for pain um, but when you're working with kids of this age sometimes like I mentioned it's helpful to ask their parents or caregivers what words they may commonly use to talk about pain like hurt or owie for preschool age children um, they can often describe a degree of pain as well such as big pain or small pain so just in terms of developmental stages we just wanted to let you know that and then for older children, they're often able to give us more details about their pain, including the severity. They can use descriptive words and they can also localize where the pain is at. So for many children, it's often helpful to offer them a choice of descriptive words that are appropriate to their developmental level. So for example, a 17 year old can usually understand a, very, uh, a variation, but the difference between a sharp pain versus a dull pain, but a six year old may be better with a simile. So for example, um, saying, you know, does it feel like a squeezing in side or does it feel like a knife is cutting or like scissors cutting or something like that so um, it can be a little bit more helpful if you're looking for the quality of pain um, to just change your language a little bit to adapt to the child's age and developmental state or developmental level uh, and then we have our behavioral assessment tools. Uh, we do have a number that we use at Sick Kids, but we thought it best to just focus on uh, one scale for the context of this webinar today. Um, so we know that certain behaviors have been validated in different age groups to be demonstrative of pain. It's also incredibly important to interpret context. So children with certain physical or medical conditions may consistently have a grimace on their face, but that does not necessarily mean that there's pain or a baby, for example, who's just been unbundled to have an assessment done inside their crib, maybe crying, maybe squeezing their eyes shut tightly, but it's not necessarily because of pain. It may be because they're aggravated that you just unbundled them or they may be hungry or they may have a wet diaper. So there's definitely context that has to play in to your assessment. Um, but what we do have pictured here is um, the FLAC revised scale, which is a validated scale we often use for children who cannot self-report. It looks at features and behaviors in the categories of uh, face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability, and scores them from zero to two uh, for a total score out of 10. And it's appropriate for children or it's validated in children from ages two months to seven years or up until they can self-report. Uh, it can also be used in older children who have significant cognitive impairment and may not be able to self-report. So I, we wanted to share with the audience some of the language that we use when we are talking to our pediatric patients about pain assessment and like sort of how we, how we introduce the idea of pain scales. I think that um, it's uh, one really great opportunity to have these kind of conversations is if you are interacting with patients in a preoperative environment, so before they're even going into a painful situation, um, but certainly these kind of conversations can happen anywhere within the healthcare trajectory. So some of the, the language that we suggest um, that our nurses use when they are meeting a patient for the first time um, is uh, to talk to them, depending on whether they can self-report or not, we'll sort of bring these things up differently. So with a child who is verbal um, and is able 
able to self-report, you know, we would say something to them like, okay, there's a lot of ways that people like to talk about their pain and tell us how much pain they're in or rate their pain. So for example, we can use words like small, medium, and big, or we can use numbers from zero to 10. How would you like to talk about your pain with me today? For nonverbal or preverbal children, we would have that same conversation, but with their caregivers. And we'd say, we have many ways to talk about pain and rate pain. For children who cannot talk to us about their pain, we look at their behavior. I'll be rating your child's pain today using a scale that looks at behaviors such as, and if you're using the flack, for example, you know, the expressions on their face, the movement of their legs, their activity, the sounds and cries they make, and whether or not we're able to settle them or console them. And for every child, you can say either to them or to their caregiver, you can help me by letting me know if you have pain or if your child has pain. And Ashley was talking about the FLAC revised. One of the amazing things about the FLAC is it does incorporate caregiver involvement um, in the scale. And so parents or caregivers are able to go through it and say, yes, this applies to my kid or this doesn't, or actually they have different behaviors that are not listed here that I know of my child to mean they're in pain. Um, and I actually think it's a really great opportunity to start those pain conversations and let caregivers know that you are focused on pain, that you care about pain, and that you're going to be doing a really good uh, child-centered approach to pain management. So that's some of the language we use. And then moving on to uh, the concept of, um, actually, can you do the next slide for me? Thanks. Um, the concept of um, how we talk to verbal children about um, pain expectations. Ashley sort of mentioned that a little bit earlier, um, but we often um, tell people that it's very important to ask our patients then about a pain goal or what their manageable level is. So this is a pain intensity rating that may change as a child progresses through their post-operative course, um, but it gives us a sense of sort of where they're at with their um, with their pain and also like what their own expectations are in terms of their pain management. Um, I do want to sort of remind people that when it comes to having pain numbers, um, it's not the absolute value of the number that matters. Um, we always teach our nurses here that, you know, a pain number is to be believed whether you um, agree with it or not, but the pain number gives you a sense of where that patient is and how they perceive their experience. Um, we don't necessarily treat to the number. And what I mean by that is um, a certain number doesn't dictate a certain intervention. What, what dictates the intervention is the type of pain they're having the quality of the pain they're having, the um, the intensity, sure, but also the pattern of the pain. Is it sudden onset? Is it not? And having an understanding of the etiology of their pain. So a seven out of 10 doesn't necessarily dictate any specific response. A seven out of 10 just tells you that this child in this moment is uncomfortable enough to be rating it at that level. Um, and being able to ask a patient about their pain goal is really helpful for sort of tracking how close are we to achieving things, uh, that goal with them, but also um, helps us set reasonable expectations. So we will often um, ask our patients, you know, what is your pain goal? We will say things like, after a big surgery, it can be really difficult for us to get you to zero out of 10 pain or no pain right now. And so knowing that, what is a score where you think you can watch TV or get up and move around or talk to mom and dad or be on your phone or play on your iPad or play your video games and you're not too distressed or bothered? by your pain? What number is that? Or we might say something like, well, we're aiming to get you as comfortable as possible. Having no pain is not really realistic after surgery. So knowing that where, where, where are you at and what number do you think we're, we're aiming for today? So this is a really important opportunity to sort of set expectations um, with patients. Um, so we are going to sort of switch gears from the pain assessment uh, section now and talk about pain management. Um, and certainly we can circle back to any assessment questions if people have them towards the end, um, or you can throw them into the chat at any time and we'll get to them sort of when we get to them. Um, so our approach to pain management um, is a, what we call a 3P approach. So we focus on pharmacological interventions, physical interventions, and psychosocial interventions or psychological interventions, or some people would say mind 
body interventions. Um, but basically, um, the idea is that each of these aspects of pain management is just as important as any of the rest. Um, and there are, there are, um, we'd like to focus on all of them equally and introduce them all to patients all at the same time. Um, in the course of this lecture, we are going to be focusing more on uh, the pharmacological piece, certainly, because um, in the post-operative, especially recovery room environment, that um, is sort of the most uh, feasible um, set of interventions that we have, um, and certainly something that uh, we know everyone wants a bit more information on. Before uh, we dive into some more details about how we approach um, pharmacological uh, pain management in pediatrics, I just want to sort of address um, very sort of high level, some key differences between adults and children when it comes to how medications are processed in the body. Um, so we know that infants and young children do have longer gastric emptying time and transit time uh, than adults do. And they also have differences in pH and some of their um, pancreatic fluid, bile uh, fluid um, as well. And what that ends up translating to is that GI absorption of medications might be a bit slower in old in in younger children compared to older children or adolescents and then also adults. Uh, we also know that infants and young children have less blood proteins like albumin, so that means there's more active and unbound drug in their uh, bloodstream. Um, although their protein levels sort of reach adult levels around one year of age might not be as applicable to the populations you guys are gonna be seeing. Um, we also know that infants have proportionately a larger total body water percentage. This can mean that they require larger initial doses of medication for therapeutic effect compared to adults. Uh, they also have delayed maturation of hepatic enzymes. Um, and so that's going to to impact how um, medications are metabolized and also can affect the elimination half-life of um, medications. And so this could mean that infants and young children have an increased risk for drug toxicity compared to um, older patients. Um, so just something else to consider. Um, elimination of medications and their metabolites is also impacted by the GFR and renal tubular secretion, and that doesn't mature until um, you know somewhere around the first year of life. So again, infants at, at higher risk of um, uh, having sort of those metabolites uh, build up. Um, and then lastly, we know that infants and young children also have immature ventilatory reflexes in response to hypoxia and hypercarbia. Um, and in general, you know, smaller children, younger children just have a bit less respiratory reserve. So that means that they have an increased risk of hypoventilation, especially with opioids um, and any medication that has a risk of depressing their respiratory drive. So keeping in mind these differences, I know that was sort of a lot in a short period of time, um, but basically what I want to summarize here is that while opioids and non-opioid analgesics can be given safely and effectively in pediatric patients, um, there are are just there's some often um, some dosing considerations and different monitoring required. So the key takeaways, if I had to send you sort of with two salient points, are this: one, it's always best practice to consult a drug formulary when dosing medications for infants and young children. We do weight-based dosing, and it does differ depending on if they are you know really young or if they're larger uh, older patients or even if they're larger patients. So something like over 50 kilos. So best practice to consult an e-formulary for all dosing. And then the second takeaway. I would send you with is that our youngest patients are really at high risk of respiratory adverse effects from opioids. So appropriate monitoring is definitely required. Um, so the concepts I'm going to share with you now are, are probably a refresher actually for, for many of you on the call and are not necessarily specific to pediatrics, but it's always sort of a nice uh, refresher or reminder when we're starting to dive into pharmacological pain management, just to go over the principles that help to guide our, our uh, pharmacological planning uh, when it comes to pain medications. So um, first and foremost, we always use a multimodal approach when it comes to pain management. So what we mean by that is we're combining various modalities and medications to target pain through various pathways. So this can include simple analgesics like acetaminophen, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs if appropriate for the child, as well as opioids, adjuvants or adjuncts and regional modalities in some situations as well. We know that using a multimodal approach often results in reduced opioid requirements, which we all love because we know that opioids come with uh, a lot of uh, unwanted side effects. Um, and also multimodal approach can just be um, better overall for patient outcomes. Um, and then when we talk about the least invasive route being preferred, what we mean by that is um, typically the most convenient route, but 
often hear at sick kids when we're um, planning uh, pain management plans for patients, we do typically prefer a PO or enteral route first. But of course, we do understand that there are some situations such as a recovery room where you are looking for a quicker onset. Um, and so in those situations, you know, intranasal or IV uh, um, routes are, are certainly the most appropriate in those situations. Um, in terms of the latter approach principle, what we are mean by this is using a stepwise addition of medications as needed for more severe pain. So typically simple, simple analgesics are used to provide um, management for mild, mild pain, plus the addition of adjuvants as appropriate, depending on the etiology or the mechanism of the pain. And opioids should be considered and added if appropriate for pain that is more moderate to severe. And then again, not as relevant necessarily in a recovery room or PACU setting, but um, if we have any colleagues who are on the inpatient side of things, or if you're discharging families home with prescriptions for opioids, um, when we talk about a step down approach, it's similar to our step up approach in that um, as pain is improving and opioids are no longer required for pain management, perhaps maybe a child is only requiring the odd sort of PRN or as needed dose of an opioid for pain management. Um, what we would normally recommend is that families continue to give their child a scheduled simple analgesic, acetaminophen combined with an NSAID, for example. Um, and then that can continue for a number of days, even when the opioids are no longer required, just to make sure there's a good foundation of analgesia on board. And then when we talk about individualized management um, for children, Jacqueline already mentioned that typically we start with weight-based do dosing for opioid naive patients and titrate to effect. Um, so, I mean, we always typically aim to use the lowest effective opioid dose while ensuring that we're balancing analgesic effects with side effects. But ultimately what we know is one size does not fit all. So patients can have variable responses to um, medications. So for example, one type of NSAID or opioid may not work um, for all patients, may work better for some than others. So it's reasonable and should be part of um, of, of practice when we're caring for our patients to consider rotating medications if a trial of one has either not produced adequate pain management uh, and or the side effects um, have become unmanageable. And then lastly, we wanna match the medication dosing frequency and the schedule of dosing to the pattern of the pain. So when pain is expected or continuous, we want to ensure that medications are available to manage the pain that are also scheduled, or in some situations, if you're using a continuous infusion of something, that those medications are continuous. And then using PRN or as-needed medications um, to help with episodes of breakthrough pain on top of the medications that are already scheduled. We do also sometimes use PRN medications uh, in situations where um, a patient maybe at rest at baseline really doesn't have any pain, but there may be certain activities like, you know, participating in physio, for example, that um, cause them to have quite a bit of pain. So then we'll obviously use PRN medications as sort of standalone medications preemptively to help manage those episodes of pain that we know are going to come when the child engages in whatever activity they're doing. So jumping into medications, um, what we have on this slide is a combination of our simple analgesics that we use. So starting with acetaminophen, uh, it's a first line medication for pain management that can safely be combined with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for pain management um, when pain is mild to severe, we'll, we'll use these both. Um, there's multiple formulations for acetaminophen, so that makes it quite accessible for patients who may not have an enteral route. Um, we are very fortunate here at SickKids that we do have access to IV acetaminophen. It is quite expensive. It is typically reserved just for patients who are truly NPO, uh, but we appreciate it may not be available at all centers. Um, it is a good basic analgesic, but it does lack peripheral anti-inflammatory properties. So as mentioned, combining it with an NSAID uh, is usually a good option for patients when we know their pain may be a result of an inflammatory process. Um, so in terms of patient populations, it's a good idea to have acetaminophen available for things like headaches, uh, dental pain, most types of surgical pain, uh, as well as musculoskeletal pain, just to name a few. Um, and then in terms of NSAIDs, um, another great first line option for pain control, again, typically used for mild to moderate pain, although Ketorolac specifically um, has actually been shown to be just as effective as morphine in some situations for treatment of moderate to severe pain like fractures. Um, 
And the most common NSAIDs we see here typically are ibuprofen, um, which obviously is an oral formulation, and then Ketorolac, which I mentioned already. Typically, we prescribe as IV, but th there is also oral formulation available. Sometimes we see naproxen, which is also known over the counter as a leave, and sometimes we also use celecoxib. Um, so NSAIDs have the same indications as acetaminophen, but also have the added benefit of having that anti-inflammatory component um, because they work to inhibit COX enzymes, which are involved in synthesis of prostaglandins throughout the body. Uh, and one of the main fun functions of prostaglandins is that they are involved in the inflammatory processes or in some inflammatory processes. Um, some of the side effects just to be aware of when it comes to NSAIDs, um, most common ones would be GI upset or bleeding, uh, decreased platelet aggregation, which can put some patients at higher risk of bleeding and decreased renal filtration. And so because of these, we do tend to avoid NSAIDs in patients who have renal uh, impaired renal function, severe cardiac or hepatic dysfunction, uh, any active bleeding issues or coagulopathies, or are on a concurrent anticoagulant drug. Then we move on to our opioid medication. So opioids are indicated for moderate to severe pain. Um, and as Ashley has mentioned, that we use them as co-therapy with non-opioid analgesics. So the idea is that you have your non-opioids and then you're adding an opioid when pain gets to that moderate to severe point. Um, opioids are a really important part of the post-operative pain management plan. Um, they do need to be used judiciously with appropriate dosing and appropriate monitoring and assessment to avoid advert adverse effects. Um, lots of um, formulations of opioids, which is great, um, makes them easy to use in a variety of situ situations. Um, we are primarily using oral and IV um, here, of course, in a um, emergency environment. Um, in our emerge, we use intranasal fentanyl, for example, um, but that's not as common and um, not common at all to use um, subcutaneous uh, injections with children because uh, the act of it causes um, more pain for them, um, but we typically see oral and IV used here. Um, as I mentioned, opioids are a really important part of an acute severe pain management plan, but they do carry with them significant potential for side effects and for harm. Some of the side effects um, are listed here, so including everything from nausea, vomiting, itch, and constipation, which is um, pretty pretty common. Um, in fact, I think everyone that is on an opioid for an extended period of time or even a short period of time will have decreased gut motility and become constipated. Uh, not everyone gets nausea and itch and vomiting, um, but those are very, very common side effects, as you are probably all well aware. Um, and then our more adverse effects, things like sedation, respiratory depression, and apneas. Um, and of course, they carry with them a risk of tolerance and dependence and that feeling of euphoria um, that we try to avoid um, using opioids uh, for. Um, so as I mentioned, because of these uh, potential harms um, associated with opioids, they really have to be given with appropriate monitoring. And especially when patients are going to be taking them home, they need to be given with appropriate education about usage, storage, and disposal. Um, when it comes to actually giving opioids to uh, children, so we get questions about this all the time here and from external partners as well when we're teaching, you know, well, how do I know it's safe to actually administer an opioid to um, a child? So in general, what we teach nurses here is that if the child is showing or reporting pain and they are alert and their respiratory rate is in safe parameters and they have a normal respiratory pattern, they're not breath holding, it's okay to give an opioid. Um, situations when we would want to to avoid giving an opioid or when a child is sedated and not easily rousable, or if they're very frequently drifting off when speaking. So sometimes um, I'll say, you know, for example, our posterior spinal fusion patients, big, big surgery, lots of pain up on the ward, and they will sort of open their eyes and say, oh, my pain is the worst it's ever been. It's 10 out of 10. And then they will drift off right back to sleep. Um, so in those situations, we counsel nurses that it is not appropriate to give an opioid, that there are other ways to address the pain, but it is not appropriate to give an opioid when someone is that sedated. Um, we do want everyone to be aware that the first signs of opioid toxicity are sedation. Respiratory depression does come later and desaturations are a late sign. And especially if your patient is on oxygen therapy, you can't uh, trust that. You need uh, the, the um, SAT uh, readings, right? So you need to consider that, that you're unlikely to see desaturations until much later. But what we tend to see, especially with children, is that you will see sedation first um, and the sedation will be increasing over subsequent doses 
symptoms, um, and then you'll start to see that decreased rest rate um, and uh, change in respiratory pattern and depth. Um, of course, that's different if you just give somebody too much opioid all at once, then you can progress right past the sedation and right to the apnea, which I'm sure many people have seen. Um, but children are definitely at higher risk of this than adults. So it's just really important to watch for those early signs of sedation that is progressing um, to know that it's, it's time to back off a little bit, space out the opioids or reduce the dose um, as well. Um, and in general, when we do see issues with opioids, um, with those side effects, whether it's sedation or whether it's things like nausea or vomiting, you know, it, it's not always about stopping the opioid entirely. What we do is, as Ashley mentioned, we, we have a very patient centered approach and we titrate to effect. So we try to get the lowest possible dose that we can to achieve the best possible pain relief. So sometimes if we see those side effects, we do reduce the dose or we increase the frequency of doses that are given and go from there. But it's not about just stopping the dose altogether because we still want to be able to treat their pain. Um, and then certainly we want to also match maximize our non-opioids and our non-pharmacological interventions in those situations. In terms of a PACU, like recovery room environment, you know, a little bit more difficult sometimes because you've got these patients who are recovering from a GA, they're, they are sedated, you know, they, they're not always, you know, awake and alert and saying, excuse me, I'm having some pain right now. Can I have a dose of medication? Right. But in general, you know, if you talk to our anesthesiologists and our PACU nurses, they will say that if a patient is generally easy enough to arouse. They are not showing signs of opioid toxicity in terms of, um, you know, having really small pupils um, or desaturating. So no desaturations, uh, no breath holding, which can start to happen as they're um, accumulating opioid. Um, and they're, they don't have small pupils, you can rouse them. Um, and then you're also seeing some confirmatory physiological indicators of pain. So things like high heart rate, um, then in the PACU environment, it would be, that would be a safe opportunity to go ahead and give an opioid dose. Our recommendation is also always using, um, especially in the recovery room environment, small frequent doses instead of larger doses. Um, and on that note, I'll actually look at some dosing guidelines with you. So what we have up here, feel free to take screenshots, are our PACU opioid dosing guidelines for morphine and for hydromorphone. Um, so you'll see uh, doses in the smaller um, range there. Uh, 0.01 to 0.05 milligrams per kilo of morphine. So that's 10 to 50 micrograms per kilo. Uh, given every five to 10 minutes as needed. These are all PRN, obviously as needed doses. Um, and then hydromorphone, um, again, very small doses, five to 10 mics per kilo um, every five to 10 minutes if needed, but with a, a maximum dose limit. I think actually both of those say the same thing. Yeah, one of them's just in milligrams and one's in micrograms. Um, so those are our um, PACU guidelines, again, emphasizing the use of smaller, more frequent doses with close monitoring for adverse effects. And then Ashley, can you click to the next image? Um, when it comes to our ward-based guidelines for opioids, so this is just sort of a snapshot of some um, other more common things that we do. It's, it is from our formulary that we certainly have other opioids and other um, dosing guidelines in our formulary, but uh, uh, this is sort of just a quick reference guide for nurses. Um, we use, as we mentioned before, weight-based dosing for opioid-naive patients up until a patient hits about 50 kilos or so, and then we just switch to a standard adult-based dose um, of of an opioid. So we don't um, do weight-based dosing uh, for an, an opioid for like a 75 kilo teenager, um, because that would be an extraordinarily large dose. We just cap off at about 50 kilos. Uh, morphine and hydromorphone remain the most commonly used medications at our hospital. And it's not uncommon here at SickKids to have kids on opioid infusions when they have very severe pain or no enteral route. Um, for the populations of pediatric patients you guys will be seeing, I can't imagine you're going to be seeing a lot of opioid infusions. Um, I would imagine you're going to be seeing more enteral opioids and maybe some IV breakthroughs, um, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and like I said, feel free to take a screenshot of this. Um, we are also in this presentation, not diving into things like PCAs or um, although not opioids, uh, another uh, modality we use is ketamine infusions. Um, but if you guys have questions about that, because that is something that your centers might be using, we're happy to answer questions on that.
All right. And then um, we also want to address uh, another element of opioid safety, which is a discharge opioid edu education. Um, so when you are sending a patient home with opioids, it's really important that uh, they're given appropriate counseling about what the medication is, the name of it, what dose they're meant to be receiving, and the frequency with which they're receiving that. Um, we get a lot of questions from parents about when to administer it and um, the, uh, the how to administer is important, but also it's you get a lot of parents saying, how am I supposed to know it's safe to give my child an opioid at home? So that education really does have to happen with caregivers. You can't assume that they are going to have um, that level of knowledge to know when it is okay to give an opioid. So that has to be part of discharge education. Um, and we always uh, counsel people to be using their non-opioids um, first and then following up with opioids if needed and also engaging them in their non-pharmacological strategies. Um, opioid education should also involve side effect and adverse effect um, information. And then also very important to talk about safe storage and safe disposal. So keeping um, the medications out of reach of children children, pets, other people in the home, and when you're done returning the any unused medication to uh, your local pharmacy. At SickKids, we have um, developed a safe opioid checklist for kids that is given with every opioid prescription leaving this hospital. It is available on About Kids Health. You can search safe opioid checklist for kids um, and it will pop up, um, but it looks like this and uh, it uh, is given to everybody who's going home with uh, opioids. So for the, that's not even the back half, it's probably the back quarter of this presentation. Um, I'm just quickly going to go through um, some adjuncts that um, we use here at SickKids and we've tried to cater it to uh, the patient populations that we've been told uh, might be seen at your centers. So um, for those of you who may not know, adjuncts, also known as adjuvant medications, can be prescribed on their own to address a particular pain issue or they can be prescribed in addition to other pain medications uh, we've already discussed to basically optimize the pain management plan. It can include everything from antidepressants such as TCAs and SNRIs, uh, uh, anticonvulsants such as gabapentinoids, uh, corticosteroids, muscle relaxants, which our next slide will talk about, as well as anesthetics. Um, so in terms of the ones that we're going to focus on, muscle relaxants. So um, methylcarbamol and diazepam are probably two of the more common muscle relaxants we will prescribe on the acute pain service here at SickKids. Um, we tend to use these most often in patients who have had some form of muscle manipulation during a surgical procedure. So this can include patients uh, with scoliosis who are undergoing a posterior spinal fusion, as well as uh, patients with cerebral palsy who may be undergoing a surgical muscle release or lengthening procedure. For post-op pain management, uh, we'll ensure these medications are usually available PRN to start, and then we can always schedule it if uh, required just to further optimize pain management, specifically around uh, muscle stiffness uh, or spasms. The most common side effects of both methylcarb and diazepam is sedation, uh, and there's often a synergistic effect when these medications are combined with opioids or other benzodiazepines. So close monitoring and careful medication titration is required to ensure that we're actually optimizing the pain management while uh, minimizing side effects at the same time. And then we've also chosen to add in um, oxybutynin as an, uh, an antispasmodic that can be considered. Although we on the acute pain service don't often prescribe oxybutynin, um, our uh, urological surgical colleagues um, will often add this in for some of their patients um, if they're suspecting that there might be a bladder spasm that is occurring that is contributing to pain that the patient is having. Um, and we see this most often in patients that have indwelling ureteral stents or Foley catheters. So um, if there's any patients that you're going to be having through your center that are undergoing any urological procedures, it's just something to keep in the back of your mind if the child's describing, you know, some type of an abdominal pain that's kind of coming and going, it's squeezing, sometimes it could come on quite suddenly, it could be a bladder spasm and oxybutynin can be very helpful for that. Um, in our clinical experience, uh, our patients tend to tolerate oxybutynin very well. We don't tend to see side effects, um, but we have listed here uh, some of the more common side effects that are indicated in the SickKids formulary just to consider. 
Um, now, right off the top, Jacqueline mentioned the 3P approach to pain management and also mentioned on top of pharmacological, uh, physical, as well as psychosocial or psychological, also known as mind-body strategies. And so we always have to incorporate that into our talk because it is um, just like a three-legged stool won't stand without one leg. You need all three pillars of a 3P approach to really effectively manage pain. So in terms of physical strategies with children, comfort positioning can be really, really helpful. So things like um, for infants, holding and rocking infants um, for, for toddlers or preschool age children. Sometimes if you're able to place them in the caregiver's lap, whether it's um, back to chest or even chest to chest, that can sometimes be helpful and comforting for a child. Uh, for older children, sometimes if the caregiver giver is able to get next to them and actually put their arm around their shoulder, that can be helpful. And then, um, you know, things like repositioning pillows, blankets, using to elevate limbs, that sort of thing can also be helpful. Um, heat and cold therapy is one that we use quite often, uh, especially when it's like MSK related pain or some abdominal pain, those things can be helpful. Um, deep breathing, box breathing, belly breathing, all very similar uh, strategies to deep breathing, but can be very helpful. Gentle massage, mobilization, splinting, and for infants, breastfeeding and non-nutritive sucking are also strategies to consider. And then when it comes to sort of our psychosocial or mind-body strategies, um, off the top, I've listed education and expectation setting. And I know Jacqueline and I have both already alluded to this a bit during the presentation, but um, sometimes patients and their caregivers are not aware that some pain after surgery is in fact expected. So that's where some of the language that Jacqueline used earlier can be very helpful to just sort of set a foundation in terms of expectations, like what should you expect going forward that, you know, zero out of 10 pain or no pain at all might not be realistic right now. So like, how do we work towards developing um, uh, um, some coping strategies to help that child understand that the next couple of days, you know, it might be realistic to expect some degree of pain. Um, and then I've listed active distraction, um, and there is a difference between active distraction and, and passive distraction. So passive distraction sort of refers to things that are a bit more mindless. So like watching TV or just like watching an iPad or listening to music, which for some people can be very helpful. But we usually say active distraction is preferred because it um, it's proven that active distraction can actually increase pain thresholds. So people's ability to cope with higher levels of pain. Um, as well as can help to decrease pain behavior. So if, you know, a child is like thrashing around when, you know, they're having severe pain, um, we know active distraction uh, strategies can actually help to minimize pain behavior. So that includes things like multi-sensory techniques, like uh, interactive toys, magic tricks. Um, this is where, you know, we're very resourced at sick kids. We're very fortunate with our child life specialists, for example, they can bring things to the bedside that are, that's really helpful, but certainly, you know, in, in the settings that you folks are in, like, Help, helping the caregiver understand that they can play an active role in helping with their child's pain management by, you know, if they've brought the favorite toy of the child or um, if there's a particular game on the phone that they like, these are things that the parents can certainly help the child engage with. Um, we also know that reducing or modifying environmental stimuli, so this can include, include things like decreasing the lighting in the room as much as possible, minimizing the noise in the room um, can help create a calm space because a calm space creates a calm mind. Um, and then we've also listed here guided imagery and mindfulness, which um, works really well for some of our older patients, especially. And on this slide here, um, if you want to take some screenshots of the QR codes or just access the websites that um, through the QR codes, um, the Comfort Ability is a wonderful website that actually has some videos of guided relaxation and mindfulness. So it can actually guide the patient through it. So that's a wonderful resource if that's something people want to introduce to their patients. Jacqueline had mentioned about kids' health as, as well for the um, uh, safe opioid checklist. On About Kids Health, there's also the heat and cold for pain management uh, document that's very helpful, as well as a document on belly breathing if a family or a child want to learn more about that strategy. And then, I mean, there's tons of resources on YouTube uh, that go through belly breathing and box breathing, but this particular QR code does take, uh, will take you to a, a sort of acute uh, box breathing video. It's not affiliated with sick kids. And then lastly, we wanted to include some resources that are accessible to clinicians outside of SickKids. So, and we can throw these links in the chat as well. So first is the SickKids Online Pediatric Pain Curriculum. Um, it's free. It is a 
broad education platform created by over 40 different authors based on the um, International Association for the Study of Pain core curriculum to learn about pain. There's 12 different modules. They take about 20 to 25 minutes to complete each, and you can get a certificate of completion at the end. It includes topics from um, uh, assessment and measurement of pediatric pain, acute pain management, chronic pain management, pharma pharmacological therapies, and non-pharmacological therapies. Childkind International is um, an organization that uh, helps to or works to reduce pain in children by educating, evaluating, and recognizing healthcare facilities that have developed the highest standards of pediatric pain care. And on their website, they have a wonderful repository of um, policy and procedure documents from Childkind certified hospitals, including some documents from SickKids. And um, the probably the most useful um, documents that would be on that website for the folks on this webinar include the sick kids um sorry there's a background noise that was distracting um the sick kids policies for pain assessment as well as the pain management clinical practice guideline we've also included a look a link for the uh, blue book which um is actually a pediatric pain and symptom management guideline that was developed by the dana farber cancer institute and boston children's hospital pediatric advanced care team it is considered a palliative approach to pain and symptom management but most of the dosing guidelines are actually for opioid naive patients and are very similar to uh, dosing guidelines that we use here at SickKids. And there's also really excellent information on topics like uh, management of opioid-induced side effects, adjuvants for pain management, and opioid and non-opioid weaning. Um, we've also included a link to the Pain Hub on About Kids Health, which is helpful for clinicians as well as patients and caregivers, and as well a link to the Safe Opioid Checklist for Kids, which Jacqueline had shared on an earlier slide. And then... This slide is for the evaluation of this webinar and Alicia asked us to include it, so we did. <laughs> and that concludes our presentation. And we are happy to open up the floor to questions if people have them. Thank you very much for both of you. Um, I know we're hand tickets. I still learned a lot, so great. And yes, as Ashley mentioned, um, we'll wait around for some questions. If you have any, you can pop them into the chat or unmute yourself. Um, and yes, this evaluation is very appreciated and helpful um, if you wanted to scan the QR code um, to give some feedback today as well. I'm going to stop recording now, but we'll stay on for a few questions as 